Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to our illustrious Saturday evening meeting. The college consists of the following format. First, there's a brief announcements period that Charlie lets us know about upcoming events. Two, then our speaker, Joe Miller, the mayor of Canada, will speak up to about an hour. Then we'll have questions and answers for the mayor, our old candidate. After that, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where we'll each get a certain specified amount of time to rebut the remarks or not rebut the remarks. And then uh, Joe Miller, you'll get the last word and we generally will wrap up about nine o'clock. Um, with that, uh, there's two basic rules of the College of Complexes. One is no personal attacks and the second is one fool at a time, which basically means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, though I usually do. <laughs> But uh, with that, what we'll do then is we'll start uh, with the uh, with the uh, announcements. So, Charlie, if you're uh, ready to go, I'll start the screen share with the college, and uh, we'll be ready when you're set to go. So, go ahead. All right. Welcome everyone to meeting number three thousand six hundred and eighty-six of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Um, first of all, we have a little advertisement. We have a Google email group, which you are invited to join. There's instructions in the center top of our main website. And there also is a meetup group, which functions much in the same way. Little or no traffic, except for a weekly uh, bulletin email regarding, um, the topic of the upcoming program. Uh, once again, please, will everyone respect our speaker and mute uh, mute their uh, screen during the presentation. Um, and uh, one other thing, uh, there is a video posted of our last week's program in our lecture library, which you can access through the main page. Okay, now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On October the 8th, we will be taking a look at a measure. This is the first thing you will be voting on, on November the 8th. But on October the 8th, we're going to have a spokesperson for the Workers' Rights Amendment to the Illinois Constitution. Uh, this is an addition to the Bill of Rights section of the Illinois Constitution and an important piece of legislation regarding your rights at work. So this is a, a program that's relevant to anyone, uh, I would imagine. Very important program and we need your assistance to secure its passage. Transitioning into October the 15th, we will be listening to Illinois State Representative Teresa Ma, a relatively new member of the General Assembly, and will be bringing us up to date on um, what we're talking about in, in Springfield these days. Uh, on October the 22nd, uh, leading up to the election, we'll be having a program. They just issued their endorsements today, but we're going to have here from the state board chair and other committee members, such as myself, of the Independent Voters of Illinois, the IVI, been around since 1944, uh, your source for good government. So if you want to be an informed voter, and it's a good idea not to, to look over sample ballots and so forth, and know in advance, um, what you'll be asked to vote on on election day. Uh, our next open date is follows that is October 29th. We also have three dates in November. If you transition into uh, November, uh, this has just been added. Now, unless I find another anti-war group, it's Armistice Day. But I will do this be discussing <coughs> how communists defeated fascism, how it was the communists 
We heard that communism doesn't work. But nevertheless, communism defeated fascism in World War II. Now, this is bringing in a lot of aspects of the Second World War, which many of you, I don't think, are familiar with. But it should be an interesting program from several perspectives. We see this contest in progress today. You've got Trump fascism versus the eco-socialism of the Green New Deal and the other greenies. So I promise you it should be a very informative presentation. Okay, Tim, that's it. Take it away. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, right. Yeah, hang on. Uh, uh, yeah, why don't you just go ahead and uh, get started there. Um, and we'll get we'll get started with the presentation. So let's introduce our main speaker tonight. So go ahead. All right. Welcome. All right. Yeah. yeah I'm here. All right. Uh, are you ready there? Um, uh, Okay, I, I don't Have know. Lost yeah, I, I, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm back on. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had okay. to, to get the, um, the updated changes for my privacy. I had to shut down and come back on. Oh, jeez. Okay, so you're, yeah. you're, you're about ready to go there, Joe, because you got to yeah. start to get your, uh, get your uh, picture back up there too. So. Yeah, I'm trying to see. We can see you're your. You're good. Do you see the screen? Yes, yeah. we do. You can uh, you can do whatever you need to do, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, and uh, patch up. I gotta. Why don't you just go ahead and get started? I gotta leave for about. I'm gonna go head downstairs for about a minute or two. So, just go ahead. I'll mute, and then uh, uh, if you could just go ahead and start it. You start there. You we can see your screen just fine, sir. You see if I okay. I'm trying to um because I can't. Okay. Anyway, whatever. I'll just start. Um, uh, this is something if. Yeah, we can see it just fine. You can see that. Okay, give a second to re read that over. Um, and I'm going to go back into a little bit of a little bit of context, background, who I am. Uh, I'm 40 years old, grew up in Gage Park. And I'm old enough to, you know, remember corner stores, uh, walking to school, picking up uh, pencils, etc. I would always ask my mom, give me, I, you know, I forgot a pencil at school today. Uh, or I need one for school. Can you give me a dollar or two so I can go get one? Granted, I'm buying candy she didn't know about it and she still doesn't know so please don't tell her um <laughs> but I, but there was one uh, but there was one caveat that i would have to like pick up milk eggs something of that sort you know what i mean like there was it was some good uh capitalism right there but this was the maplewood store um it, i went to nightingale elementary school on 52nd and rockwell if you're familiar with that area uh it just two or three blocks away I'd you know cut in real quick grab what I need and walk to school come back and get those those uh I get the daily necessities that every house needs you know for dinner etc um and then a few years later a fair play grocery store opened up on 51st and western and that's when like the big box stores started coming in uh more of the smaller businesses started shutting down because people were just retiring their kids didn't want to take over the business whatever uh, whatever their, their explaining or whatever their reasoning was. Well, shortly after that, I started working for a nonprofit organization straight across from Ed Burke's ward office on 50 <laughs> between 50. I grew up in the 14th ward uh, under Madigan, under Burke. So my first nonprofit job, I was 15 years old, going on to like 16, uh, cleaning up empty lots, cutting down grass, going over gang graffiti, whatever was necessary, you know, just doing what you're being a good community steward, you know? Um, and it was this cool little like deli that was right on 51st street. You know, you get, a, a, there was a guy back there, you know, he would slice up your meat for you individual to order, you know, not the, you know, corporatized fast food that we have today where those profits are going to some billionaires yacht club connection or something, you know? And that really, 
I was aware that this was going to be a big problem, you know, seeing all these smaller, but I was still young at the time. I really didn't understand it. And I started, you know, finishing high school, finishing, um, or finishing elementary school, finishing up, um, high school. I didn't go straight into college. I, uh, attended Hubbard high school and I had a really great wood uh, wood shop teacher at the time. And I noticed a lot of people were, uh, you know, going to college, they were going to go work for their friends and family, whatever they were going to do. And, um, yeah, so Mr. Conroy, tomorrow, we're not uh, having it. Stone's microphone on. Yeah, I'm going to be coming over in the morning. Charles, Hello? mute yourself. Hello. All right, cool. Thank you. <clears throat> And um, there was only a handful of us that went straight into the apprenticeship school right after high school. I muted Gerald. Mr. Oh, my. oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Conway, back again, my old woodshop teacher, uh, he was a general contractor and it would always say that despite how many, how much money someone has there, they, they have to have a home, you know, and someone has to fix that home. And that's really where like my working class, you know, union um, appreciation started coming from, from Mr. Conroy. Uh, right after high school, I went to the Carpenter's Apprenticeship Program and learned a little bit more. You know, you learned the union side of things. Unfortunately, uh, September 11th happened. And at the time, I was working at McCormick Place, just putting down carpet, you know, for the trade shows. If you've ever been to the auto show that's there, that's what I was doing. I was 18 years old, you know, making really good money, living at home. Um, unfortunately, lost a job because of... Um, the terrorist attacks of December 11th and ended up joining up the United States Air Force. Learned a new trade. I was a plumber, went around the world a couple times, deployed, and <clears throat> started seeing, I guess, what infrastructure, um, the importance infrastructure has on a city, on a neighborhood, on a community. And when you start having uh, those basic needs start fall, diseases ripe, uh, people, you know, um, are losing out and our, the state of our infrastructure now is not looking all too well. And that's coming to me from someone who's been in the trades for uh, a good 20 years of his life. <clears throat> so after the military was done, uh, or actually not before it was done, uh, my last tour of duty, I was a recruiter. And that's when I really started seeing uh, the inequities that come with uh, public education in the state of Illinois, seeing the tax funding uh, go to certain schools, uh, and not other schools, seeing the results in test scores, and not because I was trying to recruit more people into the military, but because individuals were going to college not prepared, and that was a big chunk of people coming into the office. They were top 10 in their graduating class, but once they went out of state into a bigger university, they were taking you know um, makeup courses to get them just on a 100 level. And they're coming home with $10,000, $15,000 worth of debt with no uh, promise uh, to get that paid off. So they join the service and stuff. But uh, I decided to separate it from the service in 2009 and pursue a, a degree in nursing. Wanted to go back into service, retire. But in that process, uh, I had to take some, um, what's it called, prerequisites for you know, just other things, different electives. And in that process, I, or in, in that time frame, I met Dick Simpson, teacher at uh, University of, uh, U of UIC, former alderman. And I remember walking into one of his classes and he had on his the big screen, it was just a picture of him being restrained by two Chicago police officers while him and Daly are, you know, trading verbal blows back and forth to each other. And the class that I was in was Chicago's Future. And the great, the format was amazing. It started off with Chicago's past. It started and then started talking about the current administration. Rahm Emanuel was mayor at the time. And at the end of the, at the end of the course or our final paper was to write about Chicago's future and uh, what is our idea? What's it going to be? And ever since then, I've been adding on to that paper and it was going to be, you know, my book. And I've been writing on this for a very long time, researching it heavily and just wanted to leave my stamp in time. Uh, so I started going out, getting in my research, <clears throat> and I was interning with former Alderman Bob Fioretti at the time, and this was a tremendously chaotic introduction to the political circle 
uh, or the political, uh, I guess the, the real, um, the real Chicago machine, I guess, or just Chicago politics outside of what we're taught in an academic setting. And <clears throat> what made it so um, <laughs> adventurous, uh, you had the, uh, the looming teacher strike, Fioretti was being redistricted from like 16th and state all the way up to Old Town. So there was so much going on. Rahm Emanuel was pushing privatization, was pushing more you know, contractors into providing services and it was just, uh, it, was, it was a really good learning environment. I, I, I got to meet a lot of great people in the process. I kept volunteering. I did a couple years for uh, volunteering with the Friends of the Chicago River, working on different political campaigns. Uh, and that's where I got to meet <clears throat> uh, great people like Paul, uh, Mr. Harrington, uh, working in Bernie Sanders campaign. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Yo, is there a way you can put your video back on, please? Oh, did it drop off? Okay. Start video. Okay, I see it. There you go. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and in that process, at the time, you know, I'm working for Bernie Sanders, working, walking into the communities, doing door knocking, and the uh, firsthand experiences of or uh, uh, firsthand experiences uh, of individuals talking about the uh, the way communities were being divided by elections start opening up my eyes to um, the divisiveness that comes with you know just a whole two party system um, in general uh, this book right here I'll be flashing a lot if you have any questions about which book it's just just for reference and stuff uh, Leon Deprez um, Challenge a Daily Machine really opened up my eyes to a side of the city that we were never taught because in Dick Simpson's class, we're we're told uh, uh, the past, and we already do is corrupt. You, you just hear those stories growing up in Chicago, but uh, I didn't know why or how that happened. Uh, and Dick Simpson helped me uh, see those things. What were the legislative rules, the policies? What was all affecting that stuff? And today, we're starting to see that come to fruition again. Because in 21st century Chicago, uh, another book by Dick Simpson and others. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the topics that are talked in this book are starting to come up today and everything in policy takes five, 10 years. There has to be da data behind it. It's not just, you know, a buzzword that gets shouted off in the streets. Uh, even though something gets passed, you have to track up, make sure it's doing good. Uh, one of the big highlights in there is Boeing. Uh, World Business Chicago was able to re uh, relocate Boeing, give them a whole bunch of our tax dollars in the forms of TIF. And now they're threatening to leave, uh, or they are leaving. I'm not sure where that's at. If they're still trying to negotiate, get you know, a new round of uh, um, tips, I'm not sure. But when, with those tips, it's those are coming from our communities. And on the south side over here, southwest side, growing up, I got to see how that um, depravity of tax funds up to the north side. And no disrespect to any north siders that are listening. It's just our communities lost revenue to redevelop, you know, the South Loop, Lincoln Park, uh, all that other stuff. So <clears throat> after the 20, I didn't get involved in the 2018 elections, uh, simply because pr uh, probably about a six months to a year, I knew I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't academically ready. And that just came from the, uh, um, the experiences I was having with people in the streets. Everyone, why is this like this? Why? You know, am I uh, not being able to find a job with good benefits? Why are, are, is this company downsizing? Why is all this stuff? And I never really have an answer for that. And when someone, when you're in a, a community meeting and you're talking to them and you hear they have a legitimate concern and they're looking for, you know, some kind of help. And my whole life I've been working in a community, uh, served my country, came back home and I'm hearing uh, basically everything that I sacrificed, you know, my time for was not being met. And that was by, you know, corrupt political machine. So I went back to school uh, right now, about five classes away from finishing my undergrad in public policy, which has a focus in economic redevelopment and housing uh, and a master's in public administration, about five classes away from that. So I'm really excited. <clears throat> yeah. But what caught, like I'm taking a break from that now, I'll be rolling in the spring semester. 
uh, to finish off, but I took a semester off because the growing political tensions um, are, are really becoming concerning to me. Um, and Chicago's always been this like, I don't know how to explain this. So I always hear like, well, Chicago's getting worse, Chicago's getting worse, Chicago's worse. And I could hope you could see this quote that's on here right now. Um, when the Chicago, or when the coming American novelist, can everyone see that? Yes, yes we can see it. Okay, yes, cool. See it. So this goes back to the history of the Chicago Police. This was written 10 years after Chicago Fire. And history, uh, if you're a student of it, you notice we're constantly cycling over and over again. Um, this is right before the Civil War, this quote that came out, the Lager Beer Riots. Oh, this was the precursor on. to uh, the Haymarket Affair and all that stuff like that. Um, and you start seeing some of this, this stuff coming up. And it, it's kind of like the, the beginning of the device. Or, well, politics have always been uh, high emotion with us uh, in the city of Chicago. Uh, for example, another quote here. Um, So there's always been uh, passions when it comes to our our campaigns. There's never been, and I always hear like, oh, Chicago's getting worse, Chicago's getting worse. And I, I, I'm always um, interested to ask, well, can you give me a time period when we weren't in turmoil, when we weren't fighting uh, for those who can't defend themselves? And we're starting to slip towards that again. Uh, it just in my personal opinion and my observations, when, you look at this book, it's, um, I don't want to say the, the name is kind of messed up, but it's called uh, Part of My Language Rat Fucked by David Daly, a professor out of the University of Pennsylvania. And he mentions uh, Karl Rove, I'm assuming everyone knows who Karl Rove is, and his creation of Red Map, which was an operation to take over state houses throughout the nation, which kind of led us to the Tea Party. Um, and then when you look at the Tea Party to like more January 6th, this is sequential. This is a large scheme plan that has been in the works for a very long time. And I noticed while they were building their power, while they were taking over these state houses, our city kept being mentioned. Chicago is violent. Chicago is this. Chicago is a hellhole. And I take that personally because this is where I was born and raised. I'm third generation here. I've met so many loving, caring people. Uh, growing up here, and it's just, it's not our city. Granted, do we have our pockets of uh, turmoil? I, I will, will not debate it. They do exist. But for the vast majority of us, it, it's it's not really true. But when you take that layer back, why are they trying to degrade our city? Why, why, why are we not talking about New York? Why are we not talking about LA, Houston, who, uh, some parts, uh, some cities in Mississippi like that are experiencing the same kind of stuff? It's just because Chicago is a working class uh, Mecca, for say, uh, we created a weekend, eight hour uh, work day, ended child labor, that was all forged here. And if Chicago falls, then I, I honestly fear for the rest of the nation, just because of our strong working class roots. <clears throat> and Chicago can be an example, it can go back to its I don't want to say back to its ways, but we've always overcome adversity or any kind of challenges thrown at us. Uh, we had a city that was sitting in a swamp, so we raised it 10 feet. We had sewage dumping into rivers. We reversed the flow of the river. And we've always had this uh, drive behind us to overcome. And once I seen the Confederate flag wave through the Capitol on January 6th, it was just, that was enough for me. And then the kind of like the icing on the cake was when Mayor Lightfoot put the bridges up during the George Floyd uh, protest, which led into essentially communities on the southwest side and in other parts of the city to defend for themselves because all police reforce, uh, sources were put downtown to protect, you know, the, the elite, you know, uh, that's no uh, other way to really say it. And... <clears throat> I was up on TikTok and not TikTok, but Snapchat and monitoring social media just to see what people were posting and sharing and stuff like that. And you had, 
you know, roving gangs or not gangs, but you had roving groups of people like, you know, quote unquote, protecting their streets because they were anticipating this widespread bloodshed. And, and, it, and it was just all kind of hyped up between the two parties. Like they keep going further and further uh, to the extremes. And that's when it just, I, I knew it wasn't appropriate. And Chicago, even though they were talking bad about us, they're saying we're violent, we're this, whatever, we're not lost from the path. We just need to get back on it. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> um, we're the logistical hub of the city. And prior to all the nonsense of civil unrest, the January 6th stuff, COVID hit the city of Chicago. We are the, one of the logistical hubs of the world. And there was stores that had zero resources in there, uh, toilet paper shortages. We had all kinds of stuff. I can't imagine the rural areas of the state and other parts of the country, if we are suffering like that, what are they going through? And this really weakened us or kind of showed the cracks in this uh, push that Rahm Emanuel, Mayor Daley Jr. were pushing us through, the globalization, the greater, um, greater widening of our markets, which is good. It brings a lot of outside investors, but we didn't really hedge our economy based on a small business. So when those global uh, supply chains get impacted by externalities that we can't control, we feel that directly. And if we, in this next election, why it's important, why I'm deciding to, well, not deciding, but having the need to take a break out of school and just throw my ideas out there, it's just we are just not on the right path. And there's things, and I'm going to point up right now, um, that can get us back on there. Uh, for example, my platform, which I'll share right now, and then I'll come back and, you know, kind of like talk about it later. That's not it. Um, it's all based around infrastructure. And I don't know why that's not showing up. Interesting. Uh, so I'll try you that again. You probably have to, get... to hit share screen again. Yeah, I, I clicked share on content. it. Share screen because it usually comes up with like the. Um... Let me try that again. Here we go. <clears throat> so the the platform I, I devised was over the ten years while I was researching this book. I met with, I sat in uh, multiple community meetings, everything from police accountability to uh, participatory budgeting, listening to people and telling them actively, like, I'm writing a book right now. Can you tell me some stories? Let me get all this stuff down. Some people want to talk. Some people, you know, kind of don't want to talk about it. But <clears throat> for over those 10 years, listen to people, did all this research, and it was just all for a book. But one, like I said, once Lori put those bridges up, I was like, this is just, it's getting out of control. So <clears throat> the, the main, I guess, branding around the campaign is addressing our communities while we're building our communities. And it's looking at the structure that Richard J. Daly had set up. Because prior to him, there was give and take between the council members and the aldermen. There wasn't an all powerful one. Uh, but when uh, Daly came into power, he was one of the, he was very uh, systematic. <clears throat> about his uh, ascension to power. And Leon Perez, uh, back to mentioning him again, describes that in, in very, in, a, in a, an amazing way. Because it wasn't, and we start, we're seeing that again now, where you're seeing multiple candidates that are, they have a whole long list of individuals uh, that are on their platform or on their ticket, but not necessarily legislatively can they do things together. And it starts looking back at, oh, this is the forming of a new machine. And I've always countered individuals, well, we need to form a machine to beat the machine. But at the end of the day, you're still set with a machine that the, the people have to deal with. You have debts to pay off, and that's campaign financing. And I can get on that on another date. That's a whole other subject. Um, <clears throat> and infrastructure. Once again, we have climate change that's going to be in, uh, really going to be hitting the city that we're not really uh, talking about yet. We're still going over uh, issues that have 
plagued our city for the last couple of generations. And that might don't be arrogant. Don't have an ego. And you know, you don't have anger. You're a fucking man. You're a full grown man. It's perfectly fine for you to be pissed off. It's perfectly fine for you to look around at your life. Look at the girl you're fucking. Look at the house you live in. Look at the car you drive. And get uh, pissed I did off. not play you this. Know what? I want a hotter bitch. I want a fucking nicer house. I want faster okay, cars. Andrew There's Tate nothing wrong if you take that angle and direct it in the and should be direction. dropped from the Zoom. Yeah, uh, that was not me. But that was, I don't know where that came from. Um, hello? We're here. Okay, okay. <clears throat> We thought so, maybe that was your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the mayoral field right now has a whole lot of them. <laughs> so right now, it's 2022. We're looking at the increasing damage our city is facing. Not too long ago, we had a huge rainstorm that came in. All over social media is like, oh, look at this you know, manhole is blowing water. Uh, a geyser out of our sewer system, 20, 30 feet high. All of our viaducts are flooding. That's not normal. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, I'm a plumber with 20 years experience. Our combined sewer system, that water is sewer. Once storm and because we have a combined sewer system, once sewer and storm water reach, they're pretty much the same at that point. And we're kind of like normalized to our basements flooding, especially in the Southwest side and other parts of the city. Uh, and it's that's un unacceptable because people have their memories down there they have their you know collection of photos this image right here it's a great resource if you can see on the bottom where it has the website on there but it's a 3d map and you can it's it's outstanding visualization because i could read the data all day and i understand i could visualize my head but when someone puts a really cool graphic like this together it's it just takes it to the next level but what i mean by climate change is going to impact our city and we're not talking about it in the manner that we the urgency that we should uh, is concerning because when you look at that whole red part that's over in the Mexico, uh, California, New Mexico, Arizona area, that's going to accelerate quickly. And there's going to be a huge mass migration uh, because of climate change. And if Chicago doesn't prepare for it, we're going to have a homelessness issue uh, that is unprecedented in manners that we can't even fam at this point. And if we don't start working on our infrastructure, uh, we, we can't address these you know, basic human needs. So <clears throat> the campaign that I put together, or at least the platform itself, uh, is centered around um, putting us in the best possible um, position to overcome these challenges. Uh, I, I, you said uh, that the, the organization has been around since the 50s, so most of the people here know what the surface line was. And this map, this map here, this is from 18, uh, from the early 1900s, I'll say that. Well, you see the lines that are on there. The green are your trolley lines. Uh, you have your red, which was a coach, which was like a horse drawn buggy stuff. You have your elevated lines. So we had an all encompassing major network that still exists under the city streets. The rail lines, well, not all of them, but some of them, for the surface lines still do exist. They're just under a couple layers of asphalt. And <clears throat> you're probably thinking, how do we, how does re revitalizing our surface lines help our city combat climate change? Well, when I mentioned earlier, we elevated our city 10 feet off the ground. That was because most Chicago it was a swamp at one time. And most of its soil is a clay, you know, sand mixed with a little bit of limestone, but it's mostly clay and what takes so long for and that's the reason why it takes so long for our water to get into the aquifers so <clears throat> there's a we know that there's the, the the train lines that are there or the the trial lines that are there or the tracks at least and these are pretty extensive here's another map of them as well all in red these are just the surface lines that are that reach our city and to me, this is inspiring because we can build off this. This is something that's already there. This is something that already exists for the most part. Not everything's there, but it, a good portion of it is. So it's not bringing in new materials. We just recycle what we have. And the big plan of it is, is do, 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 do. 
So this is a very rudimentary sketch. <clears throat> so underneath those, tra those trial lines that we have, <clears throat> so the, gr the gr uh, gray, uh, brownish clay colored dots that you see represent the, tip, uh, the existing solar structure that's there. Uh, there's a digging method called diaphragm wall um, excavation. It's something that's used for putting in dams, stuff like that, but it's not, you don't have to excavate so much where you're disrupting streets or neighborhoods or communities. You can literally dig a trench straight down the street. Uh, this digging method can go up to 700 meters underground, pulling up all kinds of clay and other materials so we can put more uh, permeable uh, materials down there or uh, you know softer rock or not softer rock but larger rocks different um materials so groundwater gets into our aquifers a lot faster keeps us from having our basements flooding etc it kind of starts building on itself the track where you see on top is i would that would be your the old or the revitalized surface line sitting on top uh, because we have excavated so much, we can start now geothermal uh, heating our streets or using geothermal to um, uh, heat our streets, taking salt from our roadways, growing more uh, revenues overall. And <clears throat> it's kind of hard to do a lot of these widespread infrastructure projects simply because Chicago owns less than 30, 38% of its streets. So actively, there's community groups now that are fighting for bike lanes. There's um, other individuals who want to have uh, streets with no cars whatsoever. And I love that idea. If I can get rid of my vehicle and uh, use public transportation uh, seamlessly, I would. Uh, unfortunately, I've told a couple people as a plumber, you probably don't want my tools uh, dragging with me on the, on the public trains, but <clears throat> this map here is our boulevard system. And one way, and this is more creative thinking, this is just an idea, I would have to have engineers come up with this, but revitalizing um, that exist, the existing train system plus with our boulevards, if we're able to excavate out some of the material in there because there's long stretches especially along western avenue like where i grew up at there's nothing there other than like trees but if, we, but if we were able to excavate those areas essentially you have a big french drain uh, and if everyone if anyone's familiar with home drainage but that's essentially what it is but just on a larger scale and <clears throat> well, what has been what is what is going on in the, in the chat Joe Miller. And I, I'm not sure on the chat. I'm just. I don't know what happened. This is if somebody's still gotten an assumed name and they're uh, starting to screw around with the meeting. It's called hacking. And uh, as soon as I find out who it is, they'll be uh, booted out. It's We've had it happen before. And they're just, I can see everybody here is at least uh, according to, um, according to my screen here, everybody here is uh, legit. So. You know, so talking. the the and, only thing that I know to do is for everyone to log out and log back in and then carefully control who you allow in. No, I think we're I think we're all right now. I'll I'll just keep monitoring the chat. Okay. And, thank you. And I'm I'm and this is all, and this comes up too because I've have already community meetings where people are popping in and right. Uh, I, but, I, but that's what happens. As an independent, I anticipated that kind of stuff. So we have a we have a we have a uh, uh, my, uh, we have a waiting room and I usually let them in. Oh, okay. Know who it is. So, you know, there is a waiting room there. And uh, if somebody does come in and starts being disrupted, we get rid of them right away. Awesome. Not so, like, here, go ahead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Apologies. No, for me. So, <clears throat> I was talking about Western uh, Avenue, for example. This is a beautiful, uh, inspirational piece by uh, Iranian um, architect. She's on Instagram. I, I highly recommend a follow. But this is what I'm talking about, having reimagining our city to not only beautify it for people to work, but also at the same time, managing our water. And when you look at the city of Chicago, uh, the water tower, our lake, our rivers, we should be, uh, you know, the, the world leader on water management. You know, it, it, it would, once again, this is just my bias speaking as a plumber, but just a, an idea of the concept that I'm 
discussing here, uh, digging this stuff out and reimagining our communities. So back on to, um, so let me just go back in, or that's, okay, okay, back on track. I'm sorry, those interruptions have uh, messed me up. But well, I'm back. No, I, I got my I got my train of thought. So, okay. so that's where the platform comes in at. The current structure uh, that the city council, a lot of the infighting that we see when Mayor Lightfoot first came into office, uh, there's always going to be a fight for who's on committees, who's going to be leading what, all that stuff. So right away you see everyone starts, you know, uh, barking at each other in city hall, start seeing the dysfunction. And it's gotten worse from each descending mayor since Richard J. Daley because they don't control the power of the local offices, the city governments, as he did, as Leon DePrez had mentioned. So the first thing I would like to do, if elected mayor, and I'm, I'll am i tell you right now, I don't think there's any other candidate that's looking to strip away, or not strip away, but take away power from you know that office to give it back into the communities. And that's where the reforming of the rules of order come in at. Rule 35 specifically stands out to me. And Rule 35, if anyone's familiar with the rules of order, it's how the city council is structured, how everything is divvied out, you know, who's doing what, who's in control, that kind of thing. But Rule 35 is very interesting, and it's a quick way to change some um, paradigms in the city council. So that assigns the committees to aviation, housing, all that stuff. When I was all, uh, interning with Bob Fioretti, there was this individual who had recently bought a franchise for Dunkin' Donuts. And every day he would call in for two, three months, whatever it was, and he was trying to get just a bistro permit for in front of his business and get some signage. And he was calling every day, every day, every day. It wasn't until I told him to come into a ward night and speak to the alderman himself and it'll probably get passed along. But I just couldn't. It didn't the, make the only thing Spider Man's doing is sitting at home jerking off. How are you it, a superhero if you're sitting at home jerking off? Fucking loser. Spider Man is a dork. Let me remove the mic again. I know who it was. Thank you. I, um, I, finally, he finally showed himself. I just booted him out. Thank you. So sorry about that. I just no, no, no. know who it was. No, it's just, yeah, it's, it's shocking when you have some obscene individual uh, dropping. Yeah, anyway. Oh, so. <laughs> So the mayor's Sorry, role, so what I'd like to do is, so uh, so after seeing, I just couldn't, I couldn't b believe that's how the city council was was running, that we have all 50 aldermen, uh, or you have a local business individual having to take a permit to a committee, then the committee moves that from the committee to the city council, and they vote all of them on just to approve a bistro set and some signage. That's hugely inefficient. Uh, it's killing communities because if you're not politically plugged, you're not going to get your signage as this individual is running into. I was sad, and there's a lot of council members that do participatory budgeting within their ward. Uh, Carlos Rosa, the 35th ward, has a really good setup. Uh, I sat in on a couple of his meetings just to learn and how he's doing things. And modeled off of that, and knowing what the menu money uh, council members uh, already have existing to them, I'd like to give them a little bit more so they can start doing more of these local projects. Because currently today at the scale for any kind of large scale infrastructure project that I'm proposing would have to go to a big uh, corporation like AECOM or someone like that, that has the capital to do that stuff. But if we started investing locally, having smaller contractors, because what they do is even though AECOM gets the contract overall, they subcontract into oblivion. So eventually those small, Contractors are still going to get underneath the contract, but there's been a couple people have taken off the top already. And once again, that's uh, fiscally irresponsible just from a public administration standpoint. But by doing that, even if we give more um, funding and powers to the council members, there's always going to be the kickback that, oh, they're already abusing their funds. So that's why empowering the inspector, uh, inspector general comes in at. Joe Ferguson, I sat in a lecture with him at Northwestern with uh, George, who's on the call here too. He had discussed how he had to sue council members just to do his job, to make sure that they were appropriate with their funds. And when we see, we just had this huge wave of council members, uh, or the feds have come through City Hall, they've mm -hmm. gone through Springfield, and there's gonna be more coming up. 
So if we're going to be giving more money into the communities, we have to also empower the inspector general where we have the regularly scheduled audits, uh, increase subpoena power so we can ensure transparency. And also too, no one should go to j uh, jail. Granted, they're corrupt and they're evil and they're misappropriating funds. Yes, by all means, but uh, we want to make sure that everyone's doing their job the way they're supposed to be. So once those two things are in place and <clears throat> that would take realistically, if I'm sitting in city hall, that would take at least two years of legislating just to do that because you would have a lot of working parts in there. But that's where the creation of the public bank comes in at. Because <clears throat> uh, how are you gonna fund this wide scale infrastructure project that I'm proposing? And I don't wanna look for a outside investor to do that. I, the city of Chicago can pay for it themselves and receive uh, benefits, uh, financial benefits along the way as well. Giving them that sense of stewardship into their community that they've participated in the process other than just paying their tax bill. So <clears throat> this is one thing that kind of upsets me as you have a lot of groups that discuss about community wealth, uh, building up. So during Bernie Sanders campaign, there was one thing he hit on that and really resonated with me because I lost a home in the housing crash. Um, it only takes one significant financial um, problem to come up to bankrupt you, depending on where you're at socioeconomically. And in the book, uh, You're More Powerful Than You Know by Eric Liu, he discussed about this program that was up in Connecticut where it was a um, prize link account with federal credit unions. And I really enjoyed where that was going because you would have individuals in low income neighborhoods who were relying on the Illinois, or not the Illinois lottery, but their state lotteries uh, to essentially have a uh, retirement benefit or some kind of, oh, I, I got this huge mega jackpot and now I can retire, go live my fantasies out. But for a lot of individuals who are dumping hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year into it, and they're not getting anything back. And just the odds of winning are, are just ridiculous. So <clears throat> the program essentially that, that Eric Liu discusses in his book was as long as people were putting $25 into their savings account a month, that group of people, there was a chunk that came out and one individual would win that. Then they would have another prize the, uh, quarterly, annually, all that stuff. So you were being paid to save money. Uh, and everyone knows with a credit union, they're more... Uh, more gracious with loans they're not as critical as like a big bank of america and that's why they are not really big fans of these kind of um incentives because it takes away money from them so prize link savings accounts <clears throat> this is an article um from do, 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 one second i'm sorry from, N, from the NCLS, which is a legislative uh, kind of a nonprofit that discusses local finances and stuff, but <clears throat> these exist already. And this is not something I would have to, you know, legislative clarify. This already exists on the books in the state of Illinois. Uh, I was kind of upset with it because when you go to a lot of these community meetings, everyone's talking about like, oh, how we have to, you know, build up our economy or build up our local economies, fight for our people and we keep electing and it's always like elect this person and then we'll get it Elect this person and we'll get it. the more like-minded people we can eventually get there but this already exists on the books and it's not being used so and here is the, the actual illinois law itself <clears throat> and it was shocking to me that you know our uh, local governments are not or you know the city cook county um other nonprofits are not emphasizing this program now so that's where the campaign comes in at to try to say like hey this is on the books i don't have to create new legislation it already exists we're going to get more people to participate in it. if they want to they that's cool but it doesn't have, have to be just for low-income individuals it can also be about the other uh, uh communities in the city who want to help the whole city in itself because when we have one ward fail it's a failure on all of us we've come to this um insistence on vertical development where we have these high rises come in we concentrate our wealth and that's going to save us when you look at like tips for example this is sorry my 
computer is dragging. That's our. So this is the current TIFF map right now. So there's a difference between vertical development and horizontal development. Vertical development, and not necessarily just the uh, the high rise themselves, but when you're concentrating it just on one street, and you'll see in some of these areas where it's just one strip. So when you go down closer into neighborhoods, you start seeing <clears throat> you start seeing those voided areas, and those are communities. Those are where people live. And I'm focusing in right now in Gage Park. Uh, it's kind of like the center of the map, and that's where I grew up at. And you see that we don't have TIF investment anywhere around us. And a lot of these yellow blocks, those are infrastructure. Uh, projects and the red dots are redevelopment projects, but you could see like we're not getting any of that uh, that money. And there's one more coming up. <clears throat> and here's a little closer look. This whole community is does not have access to that. And TIF funds they're used for manufacturing or re redevelopment. If you have a small business, you want to put a new air conditioning unit, you can use all of that for, uh, for with a TIF, but when you don't have that TIF area illuminated, you're not in that district, and that's where that emphasis on vertical development. They only want to get that one street, that one little block of chunk. What I'm suggesting is more of a horizontal development using the TIF funds to start spreading into the communities uh, and paying for some of these local projects to where uh, an everyday individual can enjoy the benefits that you know someone with higher uh, political uh, clout has access to and, and we don't so <clears throat> this is just another rough sketch that i had when you go back to the surface lines that we have already existing on the city this is just a real rough cut of it and what it could look like when we dug down, we removed the soil uh, or removed the clay from the soil, put a more permeable material in there to allow water to drain back into the aquifers quicker. That will keep us from having our basements flooding. Uh, we can have our revitalized surface lines set on top of that with adjoining bike paths that are geothermal and they can be used year round. And over to the right hand side, you, well, the left side, you got a tree, the right side, a small vertical wind turbine. And as I mentioned earlier, TIFs can be used for things outside just high luxury development. They can be used for manufacturing. So when we start taking, instead of attacking our issue singularly, we start coming to great a, make a bigger, um, addressing additional issues at once over a wide scale infrastructure project, something that we have not done in a very long time. We're more focused, our city hall has become more focused on the high luxury development. Uh, what is the next neighborhood that we can create? And it still you know, grinds my gears that you have Lincoln Yards who received already $500 million of our TIF money is requesting another 600. And then you have the 78, which is absurd, we have 77 neighborhoods who are struggling for funding now, and now they want to create another neighborhood and call it the 78, which is, it's just, it's blasphemous to me because you have schools uh, that can't get a new roof, they don't have air conditioning. It, it just, it's, it, once again, it's just disrespectful to the whole city of Chicago. And when you take all that stuff and kind of like put it together, I just, I had enough with it. Um, hopefully my passion um, made some sense there. I had in my notes, I was hoping to keep on kind of like track. Uh, that's pretty much the presentation. Um, going back to, you know, the, the to-do list or my platform. And I really wanted to hear everyone's perspective on it because I'm going to these different community groups, I'm presenting it to them and wanting to get feedback. This is a very generalized uh, platform, which has, um, rooms for uh, improvements, but in the as I mentioned in the re reforming the rules of order, my campaign or my platform centered around taking the power that Richard J. Daly created when he was mayor, 
and returning that back into the communities. Our city is large enough. We have a lot of individuals on the city council who are stewards of their communities, who know what their communities need, but the current structure, the oppressive structure that we are organized under does not allow that. And you see infighting back and forth. And it just, it conti- it's, I'm at a point where do we continue on this course of madness or do we recognize that we have significant issues, our pensions, our infrastructure, we have increase in uh, public safety concerns. All of that is comes from city hall and to allow another term uh, to where whoever's running or wins wants to be next mayor, Richard Day Daly is just unacceptable in my opinion. Um, I appreciate everyone listening to me, but I would like to hear your feedback, your questions, if you need me to explain anything, but that was just like the rough, you know, the rough intro, a lot of information. Okay, so you're uh, done with your presentation now, I take it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's it. All right. Go ahead, everybody, unmute. Let's get into the questions for the, for the, for the, uh, Mr. Miller and uh, his potential platforms. You know, Mr. Miller, I've been um, curious about something. I was watching some old video on the old Crosstown Expressway. Okay. And uh, how that would help relieve some traffic congestion in the Chicago area. What are your thoughts on um, some of the expressway congestion and making the city a little more car friendly? Uh, could you give me a little bit ahead? Because you could you mention that again? The what system was it called? Crosstown Expressway. The Crosstown and Expressway. Then, and if you can't, uh, then making the downtown area a little bit more car friendly. Okay. Um, with and we, just overall, just the congestion, just coming in and out of the just downtown area. Is that what, just just your thoughts on? on oh, Jeff. just a thought. Okay. So <clears throat> with the. Uh, Cars, and especially going now into more electrical uh, vehicles, I would like to see less cars downtown as possible. Um, when you consider the asthma that they produce, there's enough studies that are coming out there. I'd like to reduce that. The infrastructure that I'm talking about is having this revitalized surface lines. You jump on your CTA app, you have an automated trolley that comes to your home, takes you wherever you need to go, and goes from there. So. Cars are going to come in and out of there. I, it's unless we get more modes of transportation going. Uh-huh. And when you look at this map, <clears throat> this is a. Uh, so you have the green, which is your most transit uh, av- uh, options available. Then you have purple. Then you have orange. Orange is like one or two bike lane and a bus stop. And uh-huh. you can see it's heavy on there. So but it's all concentrated downtown until we start investing into our neighborhoods, developing horizontally going into our neighborhoods, we won't be able to ease that congestion downtown. I guess that's the answer to it. Um, We have to develop more into our communities and then that will ease up the traffic. I was just curious what you do because I know London has congestion pricing and other things like that, that they encourage people to go downtown. Kelvin happens to be from the UK. Yeah, uh, Al- Alderman Burke, uh, was it last, mm-hmm. last uh, no, about two, three years ago, he's p- actually paid for a study. The city of Chicago is actively, um, what's it called, um, exploring that as an option. What they want to do is, if you cross the river, you have to pay a toll, essentially. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, and that's what the, the UK system is. I, I'm not really more for like uh, paying more tolls. Uh, to get into the downtown area. I'm not sure if any, how everyone else would feel about that, but. Um, it depends, you can, it, it can be started. Um, Manchester, which is about 30 miles away from Liverpool, uh, it has an extensive metro system and they built that on the back of the old tram system, which I was similar to Chicago was laying on, on the tarmac. Um, obviously they have to change the rails. Yeah. Um, and stuff like that. But the, the, the metro system in Manchester is very, very efficient. Um, you can get, well, I, I would say it's about uh, two and a half, well, three miles out of the city centre. It would take, I would say, a good half hour drive 
to get from the city centre to where my, my daughter lives. On the metro, it'll, you know, even with walking, it'll, you, know, you can be there in 20 minutes. Wow. You know? um, but they've also, to, also, most of the city centre is pedestrianised. You know, you, it, this, this, this helps retail to a large degree because you can have large shops, uh, the chains, and, and, and you know, people can sit in, in, a, in a, outside a Starbucks or a, a Costa, and you know, there's no traffic going past. It just it, as it gets as it gets superheated. Manchester is getting quite superheated, but in the economy, they have put some restrictions. Like, for example, commercial vehicles. I think there's a, a ten, five or ten pound surcharge if you bring a commercial vehicle into the city. Which is, you know, which you know, it is a tax on jobs. Um, but so these things are necessary sometimes. The way of the car is, it, it, the car is out, is is on its way out as far as city centres are concerned. You know, if you want to see the city of the, center, of the future, look at something like Amsterdam. You know, and one thing that's always kind of like we, and another thing that we haven't really talked. So there's an immense, uh, immense tunnel structure that's underneath the city of Chicago too that was used for bringing in. Uh, goods back and forth you remember the old uh the city flooding itself because some pylons had punctured one of these tunnels you know that's an option too to keep some of that commercial traffic out of the city you know digging that stuff out again and, and yeah and i mean it, it sounds very nice and, and you know it's but you know you still gotta get you still gotta get okay. 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 all right kelvin kelvin i know i appreciate your comments earlier on helping with congestion pricing and everything all right, Charlie, you're next up for questions, so go ahead. Charlie, you're up next for questions. Your hand's up, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, is your proposal, sir, to install light, light rail system around the city? And isn't that going to cause some issues? Because um, you're going to need dedicated lanes for the light rail system. And it's it's not suitable in all locations. Have you gone any further in depth of your proposal in that regard? Uh, yes. And so this is the original boulevard system that we have existing in the city of Chicago right now. What um what I would like to do. Uh, if I'm a, if I'm elected, I'm able to move this forward, and obviously the city council approves on it. Is start the the light rail trolley system <clears throat> through the boulevard system first, because that's is going to be the, the least impactful on uh, the communities, people getting back and forth. That would be the first. Where the council members come in at is where those from that one loop that we've now created through the boulevard system. <clears throat> now it's going to need to branch into the communities and that's where empowering the council members comes in at to decide where those lanes are going to be um, where they're going to be branching out from so you would be able to connect all throughout the city and going into communities but once again that's where engineers and all this stuff and then and going back <coughs> to these th th let me pull up this was the do 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 the last map that I can find that shows <laughs> the um, the surface line system, this is from 1954, I believe. This was the last coherent map. Uh, and at this time, they started phasing out the surface line to make way for the CTA buses. So these are already, like I said, these are already in the ground. They exist already. It's just pulling up a layer of asphalt. Um, so once again, the communities would have to make that decision where they go, and that's where empowering this, the uh, council members to form committees within their communities uh, to decide where that stuff's going to go. Instead of it being a city hall, the communities would have the ability to decide where that stuff goes. The mayor uh, office uh, responsibility would change to ensure that the council member and the community are holding these meetings. And if there's uh, any kind of disruptions or any kind of disputes that need to be taken care of, that's where the inspector general will come in at and make sure that it mediated properly and taken care of legally, not just kind of rubber stamping, you know, through the whole process. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, it makes sense. Okay, Jake, is that you on the phone there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jake, go ahead. Jake, go ahead. You 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 were muted, Jake. You just muted yourself. Unmute, Jake. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Jake. Okay. Um. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um. Well, 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 a couple of questions. Um. You say you live on the southwest side. Um. Why don't you Why don't you take a run against Ed Burke for alderman first? Uh. That's number one, and number two. Um, what was the other? Um, you, you talk about the all the bitter infighting uh, within the council and between the mayor and different factions of the council. Um, what, what my question is: What would you do to try to try to try to bring uh, different factions together so they can work cohesively as a whole? Ooh, great questions. So I actually did organize against uh, Ed Burke. Uh, we created the 14th Ward IPO, uh, the independent political organization. This came from okay. after the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, Mr. Harrington was at the event as well. Uh, we met at the, what's it called? Uh, we are at McCormick Place, it was a people summit. And I noticed like all the independents that were there were kind of like, I was bouncing between all the groups. No one was really formed up. So I was like, we're gonna change that. We have enough independents here. We have enough in, or independent progressives here. We can make some moves. So I started, was already working with the 25th Ward IPO and organizing uh, events and, and, and canvassing for them. Uh, a couple of us broke off and we went who were from the 14th Ward and started organizing uh, there locally. Unfortunately, we ran into some troubles uh, with the some inspiring young Democrats uh, who wanted to run for office. And instead of what, uh, going into that cycle, of getting the community fighting against each other, uh, it was just it just at the time, it just was best to kind of to, to take a step back from that, and that's when I started going back to school, um, because the community should not be fighting for each other for uh, a, a council member position. Because when you do that, you're if you win or you lose, it's always going to have that. Yeah, yeah, you're on this, the side. This, 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 so, this, this really not what this really not what I'm asking. I'm, I'm asking how do you, how do you heal the divisions within the council? And that's where breaking down the power uh, from the taking those committees, reforming Rule 35 taking some of the committees, not all committees, but taking some of the committees and putting them back into the council members power, or actually this is, this would be the first in the city history, uh, but given them the ability, based off the participatory budgeting model that I mentioned with Carlos Rosa and other yeah. council members already doing yeah. that, giving them the funding. And obviously like right there, they're fighting in city hall for funding. If I'm already providing them or pushing it, I think that would be a great way to start, you know, winning some kind of uh, allies in that aspect. Okay. One other one other question. Um, there's there's been within the last few years there's been a big ri big rise in the crime rate in the city. How would you deal with the crime issue? The public safety issue. So um, this was something that Karen Lewis warned us about when I was marching with CTU. That when we started divesting from our schools, creating charter schools, uh, giving CME and other big institution big tax breaks, that this was gonna this was gonna come up. And that's what we're dealing with now. Uh, there is no quick fix to it. I wish I could say I could snap my fingers and have it done, but if we don't start investing into our communities, investing into our public schools, uh, reviewing some of those tax breaks through TIFs and all that, that's oh, when we really well, start making criminals ways. in jail. The, the, the mayor has no power to put people in jail. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, but the, but the, police chief, the police chief does. Okay, um, Jake, uh, let's move on if you don't mind. Okay, all right, uh, all right. I, I, I think that's Ed Rios and Linda up there. Linda's iPhone, you're next. Please uh, ask your question. Hi, uh, you said that the city of Chicago has um, only owns, I think was the term you used, 38% of its roads. And if you could clarify that, I assume you mean the rest are either federal, county, or state roads, but 38% seems a low number. And the other thing is we used to have a member of the college for decades called Bill Went. And one of the things Bill loved to talk about was um, for surface transportation was uh, elevated, um, tr elevated transportation like they have in Seattle. 
Um, he thought they would run on tires, that they would be quiet, that um, they'd be, you know, wouldn't take surface um, surface area. And uh, he thought that they could, we're using the Seattle example, would be a lot less impact on this street life and uh, easier to put up than uh, surface things. Thank you. I don't know. Uh, your Seattle point is actually one of my um, one of my resources that I use because they that was a publicly funded uh, transportation uh, public private partnership. Contrary to our parking meter deal and the Skyway deal, the company who won that contract, even though they are the ones who put the money up, they received their um, their profits plus X amount of dollars, and then it went back over to the city control. So that Seattle model is uh, a great one to build upon. This was just a rough idea just because it, it's a valid point having it. I'm not sure how you address privacy issues if people would want, you know, a rail going past their home. Um, it just knowing that we have the surface lines, the trolley lines still underneath asphalt uh, is just a, a quick, a, a quick idea to build off of. Okay, uh, Attorney Larry Redmond. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait. I'm the sorry. Other, the other question was about the 38 Chicago only owns. Or oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, the Chicago Department of Transportation, they have a PowerPoint that's on their their website, and they discuss about the hierarchy of transportation, and less than 38 percent is owned by the actual city of Chicago. Most of the, the side streets are Chicago's, but yeah, you have an overlapping county, uh, state, and federal. Uh, another point of separating from Cook County would be gaining back those county owned streets back into the city of Chicago. So yeah, it's, it, it's, I know it sounds low, but yeah, that is according to the Chicago Department of Transportation, less than 38% is Chicago owned. Maybe that's why they never get plowed. And that's a big issue of infrastructure projects because you can't have this wide scaping uh, you know, let's all re-asphalt uh, Ashland, but it, it has to go through different governmental bodies. Uh, I think Illinois has like over 700 levels of government. There's a huge debate now of townships uh, in local government. What should we do with them? So this is just minimizing the multiple layers of government. Wouldn't that get rid of jobs though? What do you mean? The, the jobs would still exist because you would have to absorb those into the the new structure, they wouldn't really necessarily go away. They would only go away if there was, um, you know, some kind of duplicative thing. Yeah, duplicate, you know, overlapping. Just the kind people of like office. ask questions, please. All right, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, Charlie we are, we're in the question and answer period. Okay, Attorney Larry Redmond, you're next, sir. Please uh, answer your question. It would be nice to see if you could, please. Uh, hang on, I can, I can do both of those. Okay, Larry, thanks. All right, we appreciate it. Okay. And, uh, thank you for showing yourself, Larry. Not a problem. Uh, my question is this. Um, have you given any, have you spent any time researching why the city stopped using those light rail systems? Because um, I was around during some of that time. And uh, light rail with, um, light rail can be a problem. Because if something gets on the tracks, it stops up the whole stops with the whole line. And I think part of the reason that the city got rid of, 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 of light rail or, or, or street rail is because um, they wanted to go to buses. And back then um, we used propane buses, so they weren't as, um, as, um, as dirty as a, as a diesel that we're using now. But the issue was uh, it was too easy to stop the rail line. Uh, anything could stop the whole line. And I, I was wondering if you've done any research, any, uh, any research into why it was stopped uh, being used in the first place? Uh, yes, I have, uh, Mr. Redmond. The, <clears throat> the horde, another thing too I heard about uh, is the horde conditions that they were. They weren't reliable. They had a small box of sand that I guess people would use in case they got sick. Uh, they were loud. People always complain about them. They were just like our public housing in the city of Chicago were not maintained properly. Uh, I went to, which is, went to Milan um, not too long ago. The two pictures that you see there next to that boulevard system, uh, that's what I'm kind of imagining within our, on the boulevard system itself. Uh, this is a system that is used in 
major, a lot of major uh, metropolises around the world. And when you just on the tourism side of things, it will kind of bring that old school uh, style of, you know, tourism back. Like who would want, who wouldn't want to ride a style trolley like this? But yes, I have experienced the negative setbacks or the negative, um, the negatives that were the old surface line. Um, they weren't really too pleasant, especially everything from the Chicago Daily in the Tribune, they had some really choice words for the, but once again, it's the city not wanting to invest in them. And if we're going to be moving forward, having the public bank attached to it to where residents are receiving revenue off of this as well as the city itself, I think there, I think it would have foster a little bit more um, stewardship towards them. But at the same time too, we have to be aware of our city's past and, um, the failed system that was and why it no, is no longer there. Um, I can say that the Manchester system breaks down very, very uh, infrequently. Um, I've no actually I've never known a line to be down because there's something uh, on the tracks. I'm sorry, you said frequently or infrequently, sir? Uh, infrequently. I'm, I've I've been there quite. I mean, I I go to see your daughter quite often, and um, I've never known the tracks to be down. Does you anyone know, else have? Does anyone else have it? Because I was. I, in... I've, I've I've never known the metro system any any lines in the metro system. I can add to that. Uh, I'm secretary of. Citizens taking action for advancement of public transit. Um, the issue was not that the line was closed or lines were closed at any given time. There was a movement called the city beautification and the gasoline GM, the auto, auto bus manufacturers and the rubber companies uh, made a concerted effort to convince cities for city beautification to remove the um, wire structure, catenary structure, which you need at the time for streetcar systems. And that was the primary reason for the conversion from streetcars. Uh, the streetcars had, that's why we, we tried introducing in Chicago the green what they called the Green Hornet. There were modernization of streetcars called the President's Conference Car uh, to make them modern and so forth. Uh, but it was simply a matter of choice, uh, conversion to internal combustion vehicles uh, by the people who gained to profit by their sale and maintenance. Yeah, there is, there is. All right, who's next on the questions period here? We got uh, no hands up, so if anybody right. else has a question, uh, Bob, I know you probably are chomping at the bit, so why don't you ask something, Mr. Matter? I guess not. Margaret, you got anything? Because I know you're doing, Mr. Harrington, we uh, haven't heard from you yet. We're looking for questions for this thing. All right, Joe, Um. When you're talking about, you know, Chicago infrastructure and everything else, um, how do you think you're going to be able to make it as a white male running in the city of Chicago right now when we got all these uh, other ethnic groups vying for political power? Um, and I'm relying on if an individual who is not born and raised in the city of Chicago can come to prominence with and get into elected office, who doesn't volunteer into their communities, who doesn't really do community work, they've just been plugged up into a political machine, um, do people they know. I'm running as independent in the city and I'm asking for help from family members and people I've known. I grew up in the city, born and raised here. My connection to all the communities uh, in the city of Chicago runs deep. From the surface level, yes, I am a white male, 
and but I'm third generation here, mm-hmm. and over those third generations, my family has um, has interracial uh, relations or interracial marriages. My kids, um, my ties, like I said, runs deep into all the communities in the city of Chicago. Um, I don't want to see another you know mayor that really not from Chicago doesn't know the perspective, doesn't know what it's like growing up on the south or west side of the city, has the struggles. Uh, but because they had a job and they cozied up to the right lobbyist group, they have the big funding, they're the ones in charge. Uh, I'm anticipating I won't win, but I'm going to give it a shot because I don't want to live with the regret that I didn't say something. All right. And Go ahead. I'm sorry. For all of us latecomers, can you just, again, briefly uh, tell us where, what part of the city you're from? I'm a sorry? Of, a lot oh, of late- uh, yeah, a lot okay, of late yeah. came in. Uh, born and raised in the Gage Park community, 14th Ward, and <laughs> grew up there, yeah, my whole life. And now yeah. I'm living in Bridgeport uh, simply because of, um, I had a downsize, I, and I like the condo I have. I'm two blocks away from the Sox Park. I'm a huge baseball fan, so I figured when I'm not researching the city's history, it's politics, it's policies, I can go have a baseball game every once in a while oh anti-cub or what uh no uh i just would prefer they would leave the city maybe go to rosemont or something <laughs> okay all right Mar- that, that's a good answer margaret you're next please uh go ahead yeah did you uh yeah. Yeah. some people to get into city government use the metropolitan water uh uh reclamation district as a stepping stone and so i'm wondering if you had considered that and because that i came in late and but it sounded like you had a, a plan for that somehow or for a piece of that but i i could be wrong but i just wondered if you ever uh thought about using that as a stepping stone no no it, it, it's a good one i so when i <clears throat> and to briefly answer that so when i left dick simpson and he was kind of directing me like how, you know, to get into Chicago politics or what was the right way to do it. I, I looked at it, um, interned with Fioretti, looked at other groups. It wasn't until after the Bernie Sanders campaign that I started seeing that even though you, you, if you're not, if you're not making the deals or willing to make the deals, you're not going to progress. Uh, you're not going to progress any higher. Um, unfortunately, the Air Force has instilled with in, into me a. Um, a great respect towards integrity. And I can't, I, I really don't have a compromise towards that. And trying to work your way up through the party, you kind of, you're gonna have to make some deals. And I just, and it, it, I just put the city over, you know, a, a party. Just a PS, we're old, old friends of Dick Simpson. We have a, an enormous respect for him. And so oh, yeah, he, I'm glad that you came through all that. No, he's been, he was a great guy. Um, he still like is. I said, you, yeah, and I haven't talked to him because obviously I'm not attending classes right now. It's just um, you, like I said, growing up in the city of Chicago, you know what it's like. You hear the stories and you're kind of like beaten down with it. You don't try to do anything, but um, uh, Simpson was able to revitalize that. Like, hey, this is, this is you know, your city and, you know, uh, Chicago, maybe it's just the south side in me, but when you're, you know, disrespecting the city, kind of, you got to say something about it. Yeah, he just retired, actually. Mm-hmm. So anyway, okay, I'm done. All right, Mr. Harrington, uh, go ahead, please. Um, Joe, I'll, I'll tell you that I'm a proud graduate of the Chicago Public Schools. I had a fabulous education, elementary and high school in Chicago, public schools, and I want to know that, want to hear your take on what you would prescribe for public education in the city. We know that in about a year, two or three years from now, the school board will be elected rather than appointed by the mayor. However, I do believe the powers that be will still have lots of influence on funding and financing for the schools, the, um, and give, give influence about what happens in, in schooling from that aspect. But it, as mayor, what would you like to, what challenge, what charge 
would you give anybody who's managing our public school system? As being Nightingale Elementary School, Harvard High School, <clears throat> both wonderful CPS uh, public institutions, when I reflect on individuals and the um, the paths that were that some people kind of lost with within, they could have been a whole lot better if they had the resources available to them. Uh, raising up two children in the Chicago public school system, uh, my experience as a recruiter, seeing uh, the the I'm trying to not cuss here, but um, <clears throat> The disrespect towards our public school system is just, uh, it's unacceptable. Uh, in, the, in growing, we're still approving charter schools in the city of Chicago. Um, and the more that we do that, the less funding is going to come from our schools. I'm hoping with the opening of the public bank, the prize link savings programs, we can start getting uh, more funding into our schools. Additionally, another way. Uh, I grew up as a, uh, a graffiti artist. I was a huge hip hop fan, break dancing, uh, all that stuff. I met a teacher, uh, Lavi Raven was his name, English teacher. He was uh, an old school graffiti writer in the city of Chicago. But he taught me what like hip hop was about, that it was more than just uh, vandalizing, it was more of a cultural movement, uh, bringing the community back together. The city of Chicago has public art programs all around the city. You have murals going up everywhere, but spray paint is still illegal in the city of Chicago. When daily, uh, banned it back in 93. His chief financial officer warned him against it. And the city lost $375,000 in sales tax within the first six months. Um, knowing those kind of, um, um, what's it called, Re uh, regenerative laws are on the books, reversing those, taking those monies and allocating them to our public schools, really embracing the art and talent that's in the city and taking that money and funneling it back into schools. That'd be my best approach to it. But yeah, I would have an elected school board um it's not no administrator it should be teachers leading the way it shouldn't be an administrator it's just my opinion thank you all right uh charlie you're next yeah joe the very fastest any infrastructure project and transit could be accomplished is somewhere like three to five years the very fastest in the meantime cta over the past few years has cut just significantly uh, schedules and routes. And our group is advocating for 24 hour service to all neighborhoods. And we'd also like to see free public transit. Have you given any consideration uh, to those very simple achievements? Oh yeah, uh, so when the parking meter deal and the Skyway deal was going on. There was another privatization that was going to, it was receiving funding already. It was a bus rapid transit. They started putting those stations, um, you know, downtown as kind of a model to show. Uh, they lost favor extremely quickly because of the revenues that was already being lost because of the parking meter deal and the uh, Skyway deal. That's the cuts in service that we're experiencing now is to, and then you hear, you look at social media, you see a lot of the news about the crime and everything that's on public transportation. It's to kind of push the public narrative to support that, once again, privatization um, or that supposedly it's a public private partnership, but it's another privatization effort towards our public transit system. Uh, the CTA exists because of a failed privatized, uh, privatized network. Um, getting it back to where and that's where the, the the light rail system where i have in place right now we have semi trucks that are running california automated no one's behind them fully if we can revitalize the surface line system or even just have the trolley system through the boulevard automated uh where you push an app and it arrives to you if it if we can have vehicles that can drive down a public road without a driver i'm pretty sure we can have a uh, a light rail system that's on tracks that's automated as well. And that would be your 24 hour uh, service right there. Okay. All right, I have a question now, if you don't mind, Joe. Go right ahead. Um, I can pick these up for less than $7 a peck in McHenry County. Yet when I go downtown, they're almost 14 to $16 a peck. 
and I can point to example upon example of uh, taxes in Crook County that uh, go on like crazy. Isn't that one of the big reasons why people are starting to get out of Chicago as well as some of the uh, boot laws and some of the other parking violations and things like that that are nuisances to the city of Chicago? I know a lot of people who've moved out because of it. As a matter of fact, one guy at work said uh, he lived in the city of Chicago and he got like five parking tickets in a year because of some stupid law that he had to follow on it. Since he's moved out, he has saved himself over two grand a year in taxes alone. Yeah. Um, smoking, that, that's your choice. I, 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 I second your, um, I only smoke when I drink. I will admit that. And I still remember the, I'm glad they're not in restaurants anymore too. Right. Uh, but we have a tax issue and that's where when you have back in like, what was it? 23rd, or 20, between 11, 2011 and 2013, the CME Chicago Mercantile Exchange received a very generous $85 million tax break from the city county. Uh, part of the reasons for separating Cook County is getting control uh, of the revenue that comes into Chicago. Uh, having Cook County over us is kind of uh, strange when you look at New York as its own county, LA is its own county, Houston's its own county, but Chicago is still has another government on top of us. But a lot of that tax revenue or the reg uh, regressive uh, tax that we're facing is because we have wide scale uh, vacant lots or vacant parcels across the south and west side. In the city's inventory right now, there's over 35 or 3,200, I believe it is, or 32,000 residential parcels in the inventory. Cook County has like 75,000. Private investors even have more, but that's where the vertical development I was talking about, we're concentrating wealth in areas around Lincoln Yards or where these developers are sitting down with the mayor and other council members and deciding these neighborhoods are gonna succeed while these other fail. It's price manipulation at a policy level. Until we start getting those communities um, equal transit, and that's where the surface line comes in at to add accessibility to those neighborhoods, uh, those taxes are still going to be high because they have to make up the money because they've been giving it out to their friends. So they hurt us on the on the tax side. So, yeah, I would like all of us to start lessening our tax burden for sure. Okay, I was just curious. Who else has a question now? Otherwise, we'll uh, start moving into the rebuttal session of the, of the portion. Who else has a question? Uh, Bob Matter, you probably got something to say about this. Do you have any questions? Oh, man. All right, anybody? Okay, let's go into the next session. All right, um, we're going to go into our rebuttal sessions now. Let's uh, unmute. Let's thank our speaker for a well-rounded, well-good presentation. Joe, I know you've got a platform, and I know you're an ex-serviceman, and uh, I'm gonna wish you well on this thing. And uh, I, the next part of our meeting will be a rebuttal period where we'll get a chance to uh, rebut our speaker and you'll each get a chance to uh, uh, say your piece for, I'll give you everybody about six minutes. So who's got a rebuttal real quick? Go ahead, either raise your hand or just let me know. Nobody's got rebuttals tonight. All right. Uh, Mr. Rios, we'll let you go. Uh, who else? Okay, Bob Matters got one. Um, Charles Paydux got one. Who else? Okay, uh, Margaret and Frank, who else? Um, Kelvin, you got anything you want to say? You usually do. Um, not really, no. Okay, uh, and Mr. Miller, you'll get the last word. So we got four people so far. Um, you know, uh, and uh, just real quick before we move in, what my, I have another guest here. She says, what didn't you like about the schools, Joe, real quick? And then we'll go right to rebuttals. Uh, what I didn't like about the schools. Um, what don't you like about the schools? Oh, right now, uh, essentially, I, I guess like I, I, my biggest criticism of the schools is is dealing like so when my daughter was applying for high school, um, it's based on a lottery system that's sometimes harder. It actually is, or according to UIC and University of Chicago, it's harder to get into Chicago public high schools than it is some colleges. Yeah. 
And having a daughter who uh, was AB on a roll, not being selected for the school of her choice and having to deal with that as a father, that was, I guess, that's my biggest criticism. We should not have our students, you know, fighting for um, acceptance into a school. You know, uh, we should be giving them all access to the exact same uh, education that we all have. That's, I guess, my biggest uh, criticism of the school. Okay. That's good. That was just, um, I had another person with me here upstairs and it just, she had a question and I didn't neglect her. Okay. Now we officially go into rebuttals. Uh, Mr. Rios, I guess you're first. If you don't mind, can you please show yourself while you give the uh, rebuttal? <laughs> you're fine, yes. Wow. That's fine. That's, that's good. We can at least see you while you're speaking. Now you can see why I'm hidden. Um, <laughs> well, when I was uh, in the 80s and working for Harold Washington and against uh, Jane Byrne and um, you got six minutes so go and, the other, and the other candidate the three of them what was fun for me was uh, everybody had a poster a picture of uh, the candidate they were supporting on their window and what was fun about that was um, it was reminded me of being in Europe where everybody had the picture of a saint that they believed in and so that was just a fun thing. The other thing that I would suggest for you, though, is um, I don't think you have a, 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 a chance of uh, winning the election, but you have a great chance of getting your ideas across. And I would focus on your ideas on how you can make the city a better place to live in. Um, if you if Focusing on winning is the mayoral election is a big leap. But focusing on getting on sharing your ideas and getting them out there and making a change that way that a perfectly excellent goal you should do. And to share an idea with you that you can is that right now in the city of Chicago our our uh, tax lots are 25 feet wide and not standard depth. Well, I was thinking that, you know, if we made them 20 feet wide instead of 25, in 100 lineal feet of street, we would have five lots instead of four lots, five 20 foot lots instead of four 25 foot lots. And then we could put in new. Um, water service which we need to replace anyway and the people would have a smaller lot they could build a smaller house and the smaller lot would be smaller taxes and it would just make living just more affordable um for a, for a number of people who would make that choice we would still have a lot of 25 foot lots and 50 foot lots and the other things but if we could get into a, have a 20 foot lot available, it would make life more affordable for a certain class of people, maybe starter homes and things like that. Um, and there would be no tax loss because you just have five lots in a hundred per hundred feet instead of four. Good luck to you. And, um, and that's all I have. Thank you, sir. That's all I got. Well, I just worked out actually you would have a difference because you'd have five families there instead of four and that'd be five lots of garbage, five, 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 five requisites for, 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 uh, for policing, uh, except uh, fire service. All right, Kelvin, it's, it's rebuttal time. I'll put you down for a rebuttal, okay? Oh, no, sorry. Right, Bob, right. Bob Andrew, you're I next. My apologies, you. my apologies. No problem, Bob, <clears> you're <throat> next. Okay. Okay, Joe. Um, well, I have to uh, uh, give you uh, some some uh, applause for for getting out there and, and giving it a try. I mean, even against uh, all the odds that are against you. So uh, 
So that's that's one good thing. I wish I wish more people would get into politics, even though like I myself don't have the the gumption for it, but I do like to pontificate about politics and everything. But I just I I wouldn't want to get the, get out there and do it myself. Uh, however, I think there's uh, wow, there, Chicago's got <laughs> such a big so many problems. Uh, and I, I actually I and I live in Indiana, so. I can't vote in the uh, legally can't vote in uh, Illinois, but, uh, but I do work in Chicago. Uh, you know, I'm there, I've been there for several years, you know, where work, work full time downtown. I was just there today. I, I, my hobby is photography. I was down there shooting pictures today, downtown and uh, had lunch downtown. And uh, interestingly enough, I was uh, texting a friend of mine. Who's also a photographer, a hobbyist photographer. Uh, who was he was going out somewhere else uh, with his wife today uh, shooting pictures and I was and I was and I was going through Hyde Park on the train and I was telling him that I'd like to uh, you know I used to go to Hyde Park I used to go for breakfast at uh, Salonica and I used to like to go to lunch at uh, Valoy Cafe and I used to like to go to Medici but ever since uh, uh, Dennis Zhang got murdered in November of 2021 he's a University of Chicago uh, graduate student who was shot point blank range in his chest for his cell phone that the criminal sold for like a hundred dollars at a pawn shop that day. Ever since that happened, I'm I'm not going to Hyde Park anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the crime, I don't think you, I don't, I don't know if you got your boots, you know, I don't know if you've got your, if you, if you spend any time on the street level, but the crime wave that's washing over Chicago is destroying it and you got all these pie in the sky ideas about fixing transit and all that stuff let me tell you you're having a your city is hollowing out my physician my uh, my primary care physician left chicago and moved to connecticut and one of my uh, my retina my uh, eye doctor uh just moved out of chicago and moved to miami and uh, three lawyers on my floor have left the state in my building on State Street. And I work right next door to the Citadel, which Ken Griffin just, he's taken a lot of employees with him. I, some are still there. And a whole law firm on our third floor moved out. Um, we've had other vacancies in the building, you know, people moving out of the Singer building. Uh, so this is, this is a real serious problem and, uh, something's got to be done to, uh, to put, you know, some, uh, a grip, you know, a saddle on, uh, Kim Fox and, uh, start putting some people back in jail and keeping them there. Uh, cause this, you really just, you know, the, your productive people are fleeing the city. And, uh, so that's going to be a pretty, so none of this stuff, other stuff's going to happen. Unless you you got to stop that problem first, I hardly ever go to Chicago at night anymore. Uh, in, in, in you know five o'clock or five thirty when I get off work, every, you know I'm going home. I'm not going to risk you know getting uh, mugged or something in the city uh, at nighttime. So there's a lot less spending on recreation on theater. So your theater is going to have a problem. Restaurants are going to have a problem. All that stuff's going to uh, you know, be on the, uh, on the wane. So that's one thing. Anyway, another thing is, uh, school system is a, is a mess. And I can't believe you would align yourself with the Chicago teachers union. I just read that the, the, the new budget for the Chicago public schools, they're spending almost 28,000 per child to send some of these kids to school, 27,800 per kid. And, they're only reading, they're only up to a percent proficiency in like English and 14% in math, something like that, uh, at graduation or in high school. That's, you know, mm -hmm. unbelievably horrid. And there's, there's a, and there's a video floating around on YouTube right now of, uh, where I, I think I saw a link to it on Twitter of a bunch of, uh, kids on the South side that just graduated from eighth grade. They're all waving. They all got. They've all got Glocks. They've all got Glock handguns with extended clips, 
And at their eighth grade celebration party, you know, they're waving them around. One, one kid's walking around still in his cap and gown, but then he reaches under there and he pulls out this Glock with a extended clip. These are eighth graders. And the, every one of them had at least one pistol with an extended clip. Unbelievable. So this is what we're turning out for 27800 a year. I think that uh, if I was... <laughs> If I had anything to do with it, uh, with schools, I think school, I think you know Illinois. Everybody needs school choice. Um, you'll notice then you know none of the elites, the elite Democratic ruling class, the bicoastal Democratic ruling elites, none of their kids go to public schools. All their kids go to private schools. Uh, and so everybody deserves that choice, not just the Democratic ruling class, uh, bicoastal elites. Everybody needs to be able to send their kid where you know where they want to go, where they can get a good education, and not have uh, and not have transgender and uh, and all that stuff shoved down their throats, and have uh, having uh, you know uh, drag hey, queen story out and all that kind of crap. I got I got any time left, Tim? <laughs> Tim, do I have any time left? I can't hear you. You're at seven minutes, Bob. I let you go oh. a little bit longer. Oh, but okay. All right, so yeah, that, you know, okay, you know, I'll, I'll cut it off there. That's enough uh, food for thought. Okay, uh, Charlie, you want to go next, or Margaret, do you want to go next? No. All right, Charlie, you're up next. You got uh, six minutes. Oh, I usually go last, Tim. <laughs> you, you go well. You're you go, you want, Why don't you go now, Charlie? We'll let Margaret speak. All right, uh, I, I can go if you want to wait, Charlie. You want to wait? Right. Yeah. All right. All right, okay. Margaret. I'll go. Go, go ahead. I'll. Uh, okay. There, just, just as an FYI, there's research that shows that alcohol interacts with nicotine in the brain and increases the alcohol effect, which is why they are very highly associated people who um, drink tend to smoke more than the average of just people in the population. So you've got chemistry against you, sir. Um, the second thing is, is um, <laughs> Bob okay. is always such a, uh, a, uh, a dealer in, um, in all of this, uh, anyway, uh, misinformation that gets tossed around by the right, right wing people who are Christian nationalists. Okay. And so um, I, you know, in terms of a public school system, you know, we can, the purpose of charter schools ultimately, when you go back to look at who is funding them, the purpose of the charter schools is to destroy the public school system. We, you know, you want, you want charter schools for whatever, and then the rest of the people can just, you know, starved by the river or whatever, as far as they're concerned. So I think that um, if we underfund, which we've been doing in this city, and I don't know about the 27,000, I don't care about the 27,000. We are not funding our public schools appropriately. And when we do fund them appropriately, what happens is, is and I, I have a specific case that actually I uh, brought up to um, Ed Rios years ago of the diet school in, in Bronzeville that they had struggled and brought their students up to um, grade to grade levels. They were at the highest accomplishment that they'd been and they had whatever, whatever. And, um, and they were doing very well. And the expletive deleted people in power decided that they were going to open a charter school there. But before they opened the charter school, they cut funding to diet school. They cut funding and diet had to cut back on their resource teachers, on the, on the special programs and the whole thing. And then the parents looked at it and, and, and this bright shiny charter school opened. So they took their kids out of diet school. And, um, the te and then they were gonna close diet school because there wasn't enough whatever, and the teachers went on a hunger strike for several months 
And so then they finally negotiated and yada, 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 and bullshit and nonsense. And so now diet school, I think is in existence, but it's like a different concept or something. I mean, it's, it's such a mess. We, we are totally shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't fulfill um, our responsibility as a democratic society and make an education, a good education available to all of the children in our society and an equal and equitable education to all of the children in our society. We are failing as a democratic society. Now, this is what I think that um, the people who are, um, you know, Republicans and right wing, I mean, Betty, Betsy DeVos, oh God, um, what a wretched woman. Um, that was one of her things. She wanted the schools to fail. She wanted the schools to fail. So the, they made a rule that the money had, and there's some libertarian candidate on here who said, oh no, the money doesn't follow the kid. Well, bullshit, sir. By law, the money follows the kid. If the kid goes into a uh, charter school, the money comes out of the public school funds and follows the kid into the charter school. So this guy was lying to us at, at, at the worst. And, and at best, he just didn't know what the hell he was talking about. At any rate, um, you know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. I was involved in the schools when my son went to school. I was involved in the fundraising. I was involved in the LSC. And it just, you know, there's an enormous amount of parent work that goes in, which is part of the problem with schools in low income areas because people are working two jobs, people are, you know, totally whatever, uh, immigrant families where people don't speak English, all that kind of thing that that's really barriers to them participating in the public schools, uh, in the local public schools, like it's really important for them to do. So, you know, I just, this, you know, I don't understand why people are not in, Public, 90% of their children go to public schools. So, you know, we want to, we want to slice those, uh, we want to decimate those funds. You know, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot, big time. So, you know, somebody with a, with an ulterior motive with bad intentions is, is behind all this bullshit. So that's my rant. And, um, and, you know, I have all kinds of things to, to back up that charter schools don't do any better job and some and many times worse of a job of educating students than the public schools do. So, you know, the, all of that is just bullshit. All of that is just bullshit. That's it. Bye. So you mean, that, you mean the Catholic schools don't do as good a job as the public schools? Yeah, they, no, yeah. they don't, because they teach you that you have to be a, in an authoritarian relationship with people. You have to deal with authority. You have to listen and respond to authority. You don't have any ideas of your own because they're against the priest, which is why the priest got away with a lot of stuff. That's why the priests weren't questioned when they raped children. That's why the bishops covered it up. So, you know, don't talk to me about the Catholic schools. That's bullshit. Well, a couple of my nieces and nephews got some really good education. To carry. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm out of order. I know, but... Uh, well, I, 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 can I, I just have a quick question for Bob before, Charlie? Just a quick one. Um, how much is that 28,000 per pupil is going on stupid sports that nobody else in the world plays? <laughs> <laughs> America. Fuck all y'all. Okay, go ahead. Talk. Charlie, go. Put your mouth all right. in. All Charlie. right. Thank you, all Margaret. Right, Charlie. Okay, first of all, let let us everyone thank our speaker. Yeah. Uh folks for his presentation and for his civic involvement uh, <clears throat> and elevating the level of conversation uh, uh, on issues confronting the city. He's got a platform. He's done some degree of thought put into it and apparently done some reading and secured some training and background in that regard.
I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, his concept of a limited light rail is, is feasible. Now, there are issues with light rail. It requires a dedicated lane, meaning you would take away parking and you can't board streetcars like you used to in the middle of the street. You need platforms and so forth. So there are some issues. There are 35 light rail projects in progress in some degree uh, in cities across the United States. Uh, and Europe is significantly ahead of us in that regard. Um, it is a suitable replacement. Those vehicles, by the way, last 100 years. So there's, um, it's a good investment in infrastructure. Um, monorails, to quote a study done by a thing we keep on file in Scientific American, are suitable only for an amusement park. Uh, this, the line in Seattle uh, exists exactly as it did for their event a few years ago. Um, there are some issues. They're, they're perfect for point A to point B only. You have difficulty in switching. You have to move the entire track. Uh, you don't want two incompatible systems. We have an elevated system. And if anything, what you would extend, you would want priority should be towards a west side circle line, uh, which is still discussed among transit people. There's no convenient way to travel north to south on the west side. Um, they call it a circle line. It would connect in the north and the south. There's some other project. The orange line, for example, has never been completed. And there's some other projects uh, that may take priority. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I've been to monorail in Las Vegas. Again, point A to point B, uh, simply for tourists. There might conceivably be application of a monorail along the lakefront. I've actually started to put together a PowerPoint on that, but that's not really a feasible design. I don't believe there is a group that meets on that that I was doing it for. Uh, simply tearing up asphalt and reusing the those streetcar lines, I, I don't think is feasible. They would require replacement and perhaps I wouldn't even pursue that. You would have to put a new light rail using current metallurgy um, and simply, if your proposal is to simply uncover these tracks and reuse them, I don't think that's going to work in any regard. Um, the also bus rapid transit is, is to be avoided at any or all locations. It is, we are vehemently, totally and absolutely opposed to any of that. Simply put in express routes. Um, nothing has been mentioned of the candidate's proposal for a bank, a city bank. There was a movement a few years ago to set up an Illinois state bank. It was not successful uh, for various reasons. Uh, there's only one state that has a municipal type bank, North Dakota, I believe, or uh, whether you, but outside of that, there's been no movement towards um, setting up uh, municipal financial activities in that regard. So it has been looked into. Uh, if you want to renew it, that's fine. However, it has not met with success um, uh, in that regard. Anyhow, uh, that's basically it. Good luck in your campaign and maybe come back uh, sometime next year during the heat of the campaign and let us know what's going on. Thank you again. Okay, anybody else have a rebuttal tonight or not? Because otherwise we'll uh, let Joe Miller have his final word and uh, we can then wrap up maybe a little bit early, but we'll keep the Zoom call open for a little while afterwards. 
Okay, Joe, if there's nobody else going to rebut, uh, we'll let you have the final word. Oh, Sharon, if you want to go ahead, I'll give you six minutes, Sharon. So go ahead. All right, Sharon, you're on. Sorry, I, I lost my connection for a second. So this isn't really a rebuttal, but I'm going to just say, Joe, if, um, if you need a committee to give you advice on the light rail and all that stuff, Charlie would be your man <laughs> to be on the committee. That's it. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just have uh, one more question for Mr. Miller here. If you don't mind, I'm going to do a quick share screen. Uh, how are you going to prevent what I call the uh, the uh, lightning of the administration with these guys here? You know, you got them, and then you got these guys here later on with along the same tradition. How are you going to stop this kind of stuff from getting into your administration? You got to un unmute, Joe. Unmute. Unmute. What do you mean uh, getting into? I don't. I don't understand the question. I was being facetious. Oh, being oh okay. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to make a little bit of a joke there. You know, I think. No, that was no, no, that was a good one. That was a good one. Um, <laughs> I could also go <laughs> back to a Clinton and uh, the Clinton. There's a whole bunch of memes out there with those guys, and uh, I've oftentimes uh, used them just as a uh, a little bit in there. Okay, uh, Sharon, you want to say something now? Go ahead. Or are you done? I'm Any, finished. Okay. Anybody else, real quick, with a with a rebuttal or another comment, Kelvin? Anybody else? Okay. Well, we'll let Joe go ahead and uh, make your final comments, and we'll wrap up. Okay. I just uh, just kind of like I took some notes while everyone was discussing. Uh, I don't want to say everyone knows what they said, but <clears throat> the um, me running as an independent, it's the two parties are essentially losing their damn minds right now. Um, there's talk of civil war on one side. Uh, there's aggressive, more authoritarian discussion on the other side. And it's just, it's moving to madness. In our midterms, uh, voter participation drops every time these uh, talking points ratchet up more, um, I guess, uh, more passionately. Uh, and we've already seen that in our midterms. Uh, when in the November uh, comes up, or the primaries to the midterms. So the primaries already already lost significant voter participation. Then when the midterms, they're even ratcheting up now. And from Pew, uh, the Pew Research, uh, Research Institute, they're already showing that these numbers are gonna be horrendous. So <clears throat> challenging those two, where anyone who wants to run for office, you have to be a Democrat or you have to be a Republican. There's no really in between. I was so excited when Bernie Sanders hit the campaign trail uh, as an independent because most of the nation does identify as independent. They don't see themselves at either or on the party. So I figured, let me run as an independent. Uh, I'm taking, I'm already doing petitions. I'm running as independent. If I can get my signatures, I'm on the ballot in April. So that's my goal right now. From now till December, get my signatures and I'm going to be on the ballot um, I don't have to face off in a primary as an independent. And a lot of independents don't understand that. Locally, they think they have to primary against a Democrat, go against that. No, if you get your signatures, you will face whoever is in the established parties. Um, that was number one. So I'm challenging just, th just those narratives that instead of building up through a party, like we can, as independents, we can also make our voices known. Uh, the second speaker with the uh, Fox News rant, um, <clears throat> Ken Griffin did not leave Chicago because of the crime or whatever. He's facing multiple lawsuits, and in the state of Florida, he doesn't have uh, he doesn't have the ability to lose his freaking home. So he's not moving because of the things here. He's under other legal investigations, SEC's behind him, DOJ's behind him, all this other stuff. That's all in the news. You can look this up. It had nothing to do with the city of Chicago at all. Essentially, he got out of power with running local offices, and now he's leaving. So if you want to leave Chicago. Good luck. Um, we're one of the greatest cities in the world. I've played multiple times. I've served my country. I've seen the worst and best in humanity. I'm in every community, ward by ward across the city. And it is not, do we have our pockets of bad issues? But once again, tell me when, what decade, what time are we in where this magical place of Chicago existed, where we didn't have crime, 
We didn't have poverty. We didn't have all this. This has always been here, but we keep repeating the same cycle every election cycle. I'm just trying to shift that narrative. You mentioned about $20,000 to a public school system. Well, it costs us 80000 a year to house someone in Cook County. So why are we spending more money to people in jail versus educating them, put money behind them, invest in the children young? That's why I'm a supporter of Chicago Public Schools, uh, because I'm a product of it as well. Uh, grew up around a bunch of people who did it and are very successful. Uh, some of the best schools in the nation are in the Chicago public school system. You know, these are things that we keep forgetting about. Uh, law and order has not worked. We've been under a law and order threat since Daily Junior or Daily Senior was in power since the 60s. It has not freaking worked. Right now we're seeing, and even when we just randomly threw people in jail to uh, say this person was the murderer, this person was the arsonist or whatever, they're getting out now because we're finding out those criminal investigations were fraudulent and the city is paying hundreds of millions of dollars a year because of those fraudulent law and order let's just throw everyone in jail because they'll teach the criminals not to commit crime it doesn't work it is a fallacy it's a it's a universe that doesn't exist you know that's just real um <clears throat> the light rail side of things um i wasn't mentioning like using the old uh, steel lines that are around. That's iron. Those are pure steel that came from Indiana. That's all local stuff. And it's really high quality stuff. We would have to melt them down. We'd have to recycle them. It's just repurposing materials. We, we talk, we like talk about recycling and stuff. This just gives us access to raw materials that are already in the ground. Granted, it's got some rust on it. They would have to be completely manifest, uh, recycled, melted down and, and, and created into new lines. So I, I do understand the engineering, <clears throat> uh, side of that aspect um and so that was just like uh, just my uh, failure to communicate that not just digging up asphalt and putting using those again we would literally have to melt them down and and repurpose them and there's already uh cost efficient ways to do it there's people doing it all over the world um <clears throat> and we have the money available to us this will be like i guess the the last thing i share <clears throat> The city has the money. We would not have gambling. We would not have uh, recreational cannabis if the city wasn't spending money. But the revenue is here. We can fix all this stuff. And if I can piggyback on having the prize saving banks, that's where the public bank idea comes in at. This is stuff that's already in the books. The money is here. The capital is here. It's just unfortunately being funneled over into wealthy donors. and the only way to break that is to offer an alternative and not participate in the same system again the system is flawed it is broken it hasn't worked in the 40 years that i have been alive it has just been this downward slide so <clears throat> do i anticipate winning i would love to uh but i would need signatures just to get on the ballot i'm hoping to get out there speak to groups like here tonight and say that there's an alternative than what's being pushed down because either part, all the candidates that are out there right now, none of them are speaking of actual policies. They're not speaking about um, how to generate revenue, what laws to bring down, how to invest in our communities again. They're just throwing out word salads. They're just throwing out ideals, which is great. Uh, but how are you going to achieve this stuff? I'm presenting at least a platform, which is research backed and has all the funding. I'm not trying to raise taxes. I'm not, none of that is part of my platform. I can raise the money. I can take away power from the mayor's office, give it back into community where it belongs and hopefully start changing those narratives and perspectives of our city because no one goes to Indiana and said, yes, I want to live here. You know, I've lived across this, United States, there has been around the world a couple times. Chicago is the greatest city in the world. That's just my opinion on it. Uh, you can, people come here regularly. You can go downtown. You can see everyone that's going to be enjoying the bistros, enjoying our museums. Yeah. It's not a wild, wild west shows as everyone complains about. Um, I can, I'm going to have a go for a walk right after I'm done with this just to prove that you don't have to worry about being shot mugged or whatever because uh, Chicago's never had this fairy tale moment of never having crime in the city. 
you know, it's, it's a part of life. And we're not even a top 10 on violent crime. You know, it's just, it's more of the right side to attack our city because if Chicago falls, like I said, it is the last working class um, mecca of the United States. If we fall, union rights fall, public schools fall, it's just a, we go right back into the feudal system where we're listening to our lords and saviors and, uh, and they tell us what to do. Uh, I don't want to see that. I want to fund our schools, fund our infrastructure, and I have a pretty good plan to do that. Uh, but once again, I need signatures. I have to get out there and do events like this. And I'm glad I had the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Um, it's really invigorating. That That's great. I'm, I'm really glad to hear it. Any other comments, uh, Joe, or are you all pretty much done? I, right. No, I, I'm good. You know, the funny thing is, is uh, I'm going to close out with this one quick meme here that might uh, kind of give the current state of our political system. Tim, Tim, uh, 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 close the program, please. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll close out the program. It's his program. I know it's his program, and I'm just please, saying. Please, please, sir. <laughs> Alfred E. Newman for president, I guess, huh? Please, sir, close the program. <laughs> All right. We're going to welcome, okay, tonight we'll uh, declare the College of Contact Complexes officially adjourned for tonight. If you guys want to stick around for a while and chat offline, uh, we'll be more than happy to do so. But right now, we're adjourned.